So this is the second part of the lecture for day two of Atmospheric Sciences 1010. And we're going to start off with the meteorological wind rows. In meteorology, we're much more concerned about where the atmosphere, where the wind is coming from, than where it's blowing to. Uh, because when you're sitting at a location, the air that's coming toward you is bringing a different type of temperature or humidity uh, with it. And so we like to describe that. So we describe a wind that's coming from the north as a northerly wind, a wind that's coming from the east as an easterly wind, a wind that's coming from the south as a southerly wind, etc. And we also put a numerical degree uh, to describe that wind. So unlike a mathematical um, diagram, uh, we actually, from if the wind is coming from the north, we refer to it as zero degrees. If it's coming from the east, it's coming from 90 degrees, uh, from 180 degrees in the south, and 270 degrees from the west. And we'll be uh, talking about these types of winds all the time in this uh, class, so it's really important to become familiar and uh, confident with the meteorological wind rows. <clears throat> uh, the other thing to note about our planet is that uh, in the tropics, which is basically uh, between 30 degrees north and uh, 30 degrees south, uh, the winds primarily are from the east to the west. Between 30 degrees north and 60 degrees north and 30 degrees south and 60 degrees south, the winds are primarily from the west. We call these the westerlies. And in the polar regions, uh, the winds turn around and are actually easterly again. So what's interesting is we live in the westerlies, and so we think that all of the storms come from the west. They come from California, they come from Alaska, they come from the Pacific. Uh, but that's only true in the middle latitudes. In the tropics, if you lived in the tropics, you'd say all the storms come from the east, uh, because that's the direction they come from. And in the polar regions, you'd say that the, the storms come from the east as well. So here's a big conundrum. What's the difference between weather and climate? <clears throat> and weather is the condition of the atmosphere at any given time and place. You can look outside and you can see the weather. Uh, is it clouds? Is it snowing? Is it raining? Is it sunny? Uh, all those sorts of things are examples of weather. Climate, on the other hand, is what you would expect to be outside. It's the prevailing weather conditions of a given region. And that not only includes the average temperature and the average uh, humidity and the average precipitation, it also includes a statistical variation of those sorts of things. So how much variability do you have in temperature? How much variability do you have in precipitation? And in order to understand climate, you have to have many years worth of data. In fact, um, I usually think of climate as uh, existing on 30-year time scales and longer. Um, so climate is a very long-term description of the atmosphere. Weather is a daily description of the atmosphere. And so we're going to give you a whole bunch of examples here, and you have to determine whether or not the weather or climate. The average surface temperature is in January. <clears throat> so this is a contour plot. Uh, in January, and it happens to be in degrees Fahrenheit, uh, in January, uh, of course, the tropics are, are very warm. Uh, in fact, uh, the little southern hemisphere is warm because it's the northern hemisphere winter and the southern hemisphere summer. Um, the continents are cold in the northern hemisphere winter. The oceans are warmer. Uh, <clears throat> weather or climate? Well, this is the average surface temperatures for January. It's not a single day. Uh, it's the average temperatures, so that means that this is actually going to be a representation of climate. Here's a rope tornado. Uh, very exciting sort of thing, very damaging. Uh, but is this climate or weather? Well, I can reach out and I can see this sort of thing, and it's happening on a given day. This is an example of weather. The average surface temperature is in July. Note that the uh, maximum temperatures have moved north. It's now the northern hemisphere summer and the southern hemisphere winter. Uh, and you'll notice that the continents are now warmer than the oceans. Uh, the oceans don't change temperatures really rapidly. The land surfaces do. And that's really important for this class. Um, weather or climate? Climate, of course, on this one. Thunderstorm frequency. This is the average annual number of thunderstorms uh, that occur, or the average number of days uh, with thunderstorms that occur. Down in Florida, they have more than 100 days out of the year uh, are have thunderstorms. Uh, here in Utah, and up in our area, 
uh, basically, you know, 20 to 40 days of the year uh, can have thunderstorms. You move out to California, it's less than 20. It's significantly less than 20, actually. But the question is, is this climate or weather? Can I look out and see that the average number of thunderstorm days is 100? No. You have to do a statistical analysis of the daily weather in order to determine this climate uh, for thunderstorms. So this is an example of climate. Cloud to ground lightning. Very specific phenomena. You look out your window, you can see it. It's an example of weather. The average annual snowfall across the United States. Uh, we are, uh, have a significant amount of snowfall in our mountains on average, uh, but is that weather or climate? That's going to be climate. You're looking at over a period of 30 years or more, what's the average amount of snowfall that you get at these different locations? So for your snow aficionados, this is the world record snowfall. Uh, Mount Baker, Washington occurred in 1999. They got more than 100 feet of snow. On average, it snowed 10 inches a day for uh, 120 days during the snow season. Uh, this is the top of a, a three-story building. That's the snow plow. That's the road up to the ski area. Uh, I happened to live in Washington during this time period, and trust me, this never melted out this year. Uh, there was uh, snow there uh, year-round. So is this an example of weather or climate? Can you look out? Can you see what's going on? Yeah, you can. This is an example of a series of weather events that dumped a very large amount of snow. It's not climate, it's still weather. Number of foggy days each year. Look at all these foggy days along the coast. 100 foggy days in Northern California. Is that a weather event or is that climate? We looked at a long-term data to figure out what's the average number of foggy days. That's climate. A water spout, which is simply a tornado that forms over the ocean or over a body of water. Is this a weather event? Yes, it is. You can look outside, you can see it, you can touch it. And then we have water in the atmosphere. Water is the most abundant uh, and most important variable gas in the atmosphere because it's the only substance that can exist as a solid, liquid, and a gas and in our atmosphere. Uh, it's odorless, colorless, and invisible, and its concentration can be described by several different water variables. Uh, it can be described as the dew point temperature uh, or the relative humidity, and we'll use both of those throughout this entire class. So here we have the changes of phase. We have ice, which is a solid, liquid, and water vapor. And we want to use our terminology to describe the transformations that occur. When you take ice and put it in your hand, what does it do? It melts. Um, so you have melting. This is the phase change from ice to liquid. If you put liquid water in the freezer, what does it do? It freezes and goes back to ice. Or if you have liquid uh, and it evaporates from a source, uh, that goes to a gas. If you have condensation in the atmosphere, uh, or in your freezer sort of thing, or in your refrigerator, uh, it's the reverse, from vapor to liquid. Those are the ones that we're most commonly familiar with. But ice can also go directly from ice to water vapor without ever melting. And that process is called sublimation. And it can also go directly from a vapor to an ice. And we prefer, we refer to that as deposition. Um, those are less common and might not be well known. And the other thing is, is that everything that moves in this direction from left to right um, takes energy from the environment. It takes energy to melt. It takes energy to evaporate. It takes energy to supplement, to sublimate. Uh, and everything that moves from right to left um, releases energy. Uh, in order to free something, you have to take, you have to give off energy from that. Uh, if you want to condense, it gives off energy. If you go through deposition, it gives off energy. Uh, we have the saturation vapor pressure, which is the maximum amount of water vapor that can exist in the air, and it's controlled by temperature. And we're going to spend a lot of time talking about saturation vapor pressure when we start talking about the formation of precipitation. This is just the initial introduction to the concept. The saturation vapor pressure um, <clears throat> basically is the maximum amount of water vapor that can exist in the atmosphere, and it's a function of temperature. The higher the temperature, the more water can exist in the atmosphere. 
And then we have the dew point temperature, uh, which is basically the temperature to which you would have to cool an air parcel for it to become saturated, or in this case for the relative humidity to become 100%. And a high dew point temperature indicates that there's a lot of moisture in the atmosphere, and a low dew point indicates that uh, the atmosphere is very dry. And then we have relative humidity, which is probably the one that you're most familiar with. Um, <clears throat> the relative humidity is defined as the amount of water vapor that you have divided by the maximum amount of water vapor that you can have, which is the saturation vapor pressure, times 100. Um, it's not a true measure of humidity, uh, but it does indicate how close you are to saturation. Uh, a high relative humidity indicates that you're very close to saturation, and a low relative humidity indicates that you're very far from saturation, but it doesn't tell you how much water vapor is actually in the air. And so it's not a particularly useful um, tool to describe uh, water vapor in the atmosphere. And then if you keep going through this PowerPoint uh, offline, there are a whole bunch of quiz question examples so that you can kind of see the types of questions that might show up on the chapter quiz.